An Agoras Primer by Samuel Edward Conkin, otherwise known as SEK3. Read to you by Kyle Reardon from the Last Bastille blog and Shane Radliff from Liberty Under Attack. Preface Ideas evolve and grow. At some point, an idea connects with so many other concepts that it becomes central to a way of thinking, an ideology. At some state of an ideology's life, between its birth and death, it reaches a level of maturity such that someone is motivated to, to divert his efforts from expanding it outward and upward and begins to look downward. That is, the theoretician pauses to pass on the knowledge to those not specializing in theoretical development. Perhaps the theoretician is reminded for whom he developed the ideology in the first place. Agorism is a way of thinking about the world around you, a method of understanding why things work the way they do, how they do, and how they can be dealt with, how you can deal with them. Agorism was meant to improve the lot of everyone, not a chosen elite or unwashed underclass. Hence, an introductory work that presents ideas without going through the long intellectual history and conflict of competing ideas that produce them. As the creator of agorism, it is most incumbent upon me first to attempt to reduce it to basic intelligibility. I hope my efforts find some small reward. Small reward. Publisher's Note Samuel Edward Conkin III wrote an agorist primer in 1986. A small number of Xerox copies were circulated to investors in the hope that they could finance the publication of a high-quality hardcover edition. Though some money was raised, it proved insufficient to produce the book. Even though the photocopies bore text reading first edition, it was meant to refer to the proposed hardback edition. This then, the book you hold in your hands, is the true first edition as SEK3 intended it. An effort has been made to update the book in order to keep it relevant, though none of the timeless and timely Agorist philosophy has been altered. Such archaic terms as videotapes and cassettes have been replaced by DVDs and downloads. Information about major wars since 1986 have added staying, we hope, in the spirit of SEK's other analysis. Notice has been taken of the collapse of communism brought, up, brought about in no small part by counter-economics. Any mistakes, failures to catch uh, archaisms, or errors of analysis added to the original text are entirely the fault of the current editor, and not of the late author. Introduction Agorism can be defined simply. It is thought and action consistent with freedom. The moment one deals with thinking, acting, consist consistency, and especially freedom, things get more and more complex. Hold on to the virtue of consistency. The refusal to compromise, to deceive oneself, to sell out, or to be realistic, created agorism. Consider being realistic. This usually implies that theory is fine for thinking, but in practice, one must deal with reality. Agorists believe that any theory which does not describe reality is either useless or a deliberate attempt by intellectuals to defraud non-specialists. When someone urges you to be realistic, may you pick an Agorist book to get the best description you can find of how Agorism actually works. If you want to find books and articles that will fake reality for wishes, whims, fears, and spite, look for labels such as liberal, conservative, socialist, communist, fascist, or, worst of all, middle of the road and moderate. Reality knows no moderation. It is all the way. One way of thinking came close to agorism and is fairly well known today, and we'll deal with libertarianism later in some detail. An ideology of liberty, it had shows at one point between consistency with reality and being the politics of liberty. It shows the latter. The contradiction of seeking political power over others to eliminate political power over others. Those who continued to seek liberty consistently and without the practical contradiction of libertarians became agorists. This is a second historical definition for you. Agorism is an ideology, then, but it is also a scientific and definitely materialistic way of thinking. It is not a religious view, save that it believes absolute freedom to be moral, nor does it wish to displace anyone's religious views, unless they lead to slavery. Agorism wants no true believers in the sense of blind followers. Like any scientifically based mode of thought, it will evolve, as does our understanding of reality. 
One who has faith in something proven false, that was once a tenet of agorism, is not an agorist. Reality is our standard. Nature is our lawgiver. In a general sense, agorism is scientific in that it bases itself on verifiable observations that re about reality. But it is scientific in a specific sense as well. It may be hard for chemists, physicists, and engineers to believe that a hard science was ever developed in fields such as economics and political science. But this discovery, the discovery of this science by me, a hard-bitten theoretical chemist, cynical of soft science, led eventually through libertarianism to agorism. The study of human action, praxeology, produced some repeatable observations deserving the title of scientific law. The area of human action dealing with exchanges between acting humans, catal catalactics, covers the same area of thought that economics is supposed to cover, but often with very different conclusions. This kind of economics, sometimes called Austrian economics, was used by speculators such as Harry Brown and Doug Casey for investing in hard money instruments, beating taxes, and surviving when society around them is operating on unreason and folly. It is that potent a tool for survival amidst gloom and doom. However, it can be more. By applying this economic understanding to all human action, regardless of the wishes, whims, fears, and spite of the most powerful agency in society, the state, coercive government, a new field of theory dealing only with practical action emerges, counter-economics. Finally, when libertarian theory meets counter-economics, what comes out in strict consistency, both external and internal, is agorism. This is still another definition. And this is the definition with which I feel most comfortable, the one that the thieves of the intellect find hardest to pervert or steal. Agorism is the consistent integration of libertarian theory with counter-economic practice. An agorist is one who acts consistently for freedom and in freedom. A basic understanding of agorism falls naturally into four phases of integration or four steps of learning. In addition to grasping the premises involved, one should be able to apply them. Remember always that agorism integrates theory and practice. Theory without practice is game playing. Taken serious, seriously, it leads to withdrawal from reality, mysticism, and insanity. Practice without theory is robotic. Taken seriously, it leads to tilling barren soil and showing up for work at closed factories. Perhaps it would help to think of theory as wedded to practice where divorce leads to ruin. Or the relationship could be viewed as that between brain and stomach or mind and body. Neither can survive without the other. So four concepts and four applications lead naturally to eight chapters. The author and publisher welcome your questions because they'll indicate where we can clarify and improve subsequent editions. Chapter 1. Economics. Economics is a dismal science. Those understanding certain economic concepts profit flamboyantly. Economics is a tool corporations and governments use to control society. Those understanding economic concepts have toppled governments that refuse to face the very same concepts. Economics is a meaningless college exercise. Speculators understanding economics make millions of dollars and save others from financial ruin. Here is our problem. All of the above statements are true. If that makes you think there is an inconsistency in the use of economics, you are correct. With a lowercase e. Economics is the study of relations between people involving goods and services. With a capital E, economics is an institution financed mostly by government and is tax-privileged foundations. With foundation money, this institution controls, however, however imperfectly, those who would learn and teach economics at government schools or private colleges. Maybe this appears to be a big deal made out of a little, after all. Is not most of chemistry and astronomy and mathematics also institutionalized? Imagine the case where only pro-government chemistry, conservative astronomy, or socialist biology was taught, and those who tried to teach straight science were vilified as crackpots. Fantastic? Lysenko's pseudo-biology was taught in the Soviet Union because it was more in line with Marxist theory than was straight genetics. Currently, 
Man-made global warming is approaching the status of state-approved climatology. With the center shouted down, defunded, smeared as apologists for polluters, and even threatened with the, res the rescission of their academic degrees. Perhaps you will grant that government can use this control of schools and colleges to teach a twisted version of economics. Could, then, better economics be taught if government were improved? The answer is not a chance. As you'll see in Chapter 6, if people understood economics, coercive government could not survive. And uncoercive government is a contradiction in terms. What we wish to accomplish in this chapter is simply to give you a basic understanding of real economics. No, this is not just to help explain the rest of this book. With even an elementary understanding of economics, fewer con games can defraud, defraud you, especially the high-stakes political kind. Let us start with why people act economically. Value. Right down there at the very bottom, we begin. Human beings act. Why? Ludwig von Mises said it best, to remove felt unease. If you were perfectly content, nothing and no one nagging at you, and you knew that if you did nothing, you could continue to be content, would you move? Remember, moving from this state would increase unhappiness. Of course you wouldn't move. Even if you said you would move to relieve boredom, you would be violating the hypothesis. You would be more bored by moving since that is an increase in unhappiness. Aha! Is that not a contradiction? You rightfully ask. Correct. And if an assumption leads to a contradiction, it is wrong. Our assumption was that you could achieve a state of ease... Therefore, such a human condition is impossible. In reality, man ha always has reason to feel unease, to feed himself, clothe himself, shelter himself, reproduce and feed, shelter and clothe others, amuse himself, and so on. Unease cannot be eliminated. It can, however, be reduced. It can also, unfortunately, be augmented. If you seek to starve yourself or bore yourself, you increase your unease. Some actions you perform achieve negative goals. Some achieve positive ones. Those which remove felt unease are values. If someone else has something that will remove your unease, but taking it will increase others, we have a conflict in values. This conflict in values need not arise from different confrontation. Suppose you and another are offered a scrumptious dessert, and the other one is dieting desperately. You value it, the other disvalues it. Value is subjective. This simple insight, made by Carl Minger, teacher of von Mises, revolutionized primitive economics and cured many of the problems plaguing the science since Adam Smith. Had Marx heeded Menger, socialism would have been abandoned. Subjective value leads to individualism. It also explains so powerfully why people trade and it demolishes theories of exploitation. Before subjective value, Marx could look at the work of Adam Smith, who thought value arose from the amount of labor one put into producing something, and see no productive role for anyone but laborers, concluding that all the others must be parasites. There are parasites in our system, economics tells us, and we shall use our new understanding to ferret them out in the next chapter. Finally, when people trade, they are acting to remove felt unease in both directions. You may give up a smaller value for a larger, but never the other way around, voluntarily. If you're willing to let your brother work for you and pay him more than he's worth, you know that this means to you he's worth extra because he's my brother. You've still gained a greater value. If values were not subjective, why would anyone trade? We would all value things equally and be content with what we had. Well, not entirely. We could also want more of a value. Onward, then, to the next powerful economic concept. Marginal utility. Suppose you, being a shepherd, had ten sheep, and a nice woolen coat you laboriously made from your eleventh sheep. If someone came along and offered you a coat just like it for your tenth sheep, you'd tell them to buzz off. Along causes a rich shepherd. Along comes a rich shepherd and sees your coat. You tell him how you got it, and even tell him how to make one. He can think of better things to do than to make a coat, but he'd like to have one. He'll trade you a sheep for a coat. No better off subjectively, you refuse. He offers you two, and you know you'd be ahead. 
you can make another coat and have 11 sheep again. Meanwhile, the rich shepherd would rather have 98 sheep and a coat than 100 sheep and no coat. But this example, is, this example so far is still one of subjective value. His final offer is three sheep. Joyfully, you accept. As you are leaving, you run into another poor shepherd with ten sheep and a coat. There seems to be a lot of this going on. He offers you coat for sheep and is willing to accept two sheep. You're still ahead. Eleven sheep and the coat. And you don't have to make it yourself. Such a deal. Using the wool coat as our medium of exchange, we find, some, we find out something interesting. Sheep are sheep, as far as this example is concerned. Yet, while well, you traded your 11th sheep for a coat, and would not have traded your 10th, you did trade both your 12th and 13th sheep for a coat. This principle where you value each additional unit less and less is called marginal utility. You are operating at the margin and utility. At the margin and utility is an older word for value. All sheep and dollars are not alike. Marginal ones are cheaper. Besides giving us an idea which can handle more in economics and also help us to spot fraud such as tax redistribution, marginal utility leads directly to the next concept. The vision of labor. Subjective value may lead us to think we would prefer producing some goods rather than others or transporting them, trading them, serving them, or storing them. Yet, it is marginal utility which tells us why this specialization works. If I produce 10 cooked hamburgers an hour and you produce 12, and we happen to eat the same, it is obvious who has more surplus to trade and will be eager to do so. I should check out other lines of productivity or move to a less desirable, at least to you, location where I can compete. This process where we are led to specialize by greater productivity and greater reward, value seeking, is called division of labor. Von Mises spec uh, speculated that it was the glue holding society together, and if you think of society as bigger than a nuclear or extended family, he is right. If Jane sings beautifully and we do not, division of labor is why I'm writing this book, eating her hamburgers, and we're listening to Jane on the radio. Basics With such, I such basic ideas as those about trade, exchange, goods, and services that you hopefully already uh, brought with you to this discussion, added on to the concepts of subjective value, marginal utility, and division of labor, you are properly armed for understanding agorism. There is far more to economics, and still more being discovered and written about by, all the, by the all too few right kind of economists. Before moving on, there is one economic specialty that deserves some extra mention. Since it is so much in everyone's minds, you probably guessed that it is money. Money. Money is heavily mystified, and it's not hard to see why. A fool and his money are soon parted is a truism nearly as old as money itself. If you can be confused as to what money is or how it works, you can be parted from it by those who know what your money is. Remember our sheep example? We call the wool coat a medium of exchange to show the different values of a sheep. But if we had many wool coats and one sheep being traded back and forth, we could use the same example to show the marginal utility of the 11th coat, or whatever number happened to work, and the use of sheep as a medium of exchange. Straight trade of goods, for goods, barter, is crude, and problems related to making change are difficult to solve. Sheep die and wool coats wear out, they do not store value well, and, since value is subjective, changes in your needs, tastes, and circumstances alter your values anyway. Nothing can store a change in quantity or, as math majors would say, fix a variable. What we would like is something that makes change, stores its value, and is universally acceptable. Everyone wants it all the time. To be blunt, there is no such thing, and never will be, though all bank directors, congressmen, and com commissars might decree otherwise. Subject of value assures us of that. But suppose some, sub sub some substance could be divided down to its atoms without changing, be more resistant to wear and corrosion than almost everything else, be easily recognized and easily checked as to purity, and be valued already by a lot of people for its usefulness and good looks. Suppose further that it did better than anything else offered in competition. Would not most people flock to it and make it money? No laws would need, need be passed, or institutions founded, or advertising campaigns conducted to make it so. Nature would take care of it. Second, third, and fourth cho choices might be used, but the first would be the standard, 
by which the others were measured. Such a substance has been known for millennia. Gold, and its close chemical relatives, platinum, silver, and copper, remains the choice of a free market. Even in an unfree market, where money is imposed by force against the will of traders, that is, by fiat, gold remains the money of the underground economy and of the overseas economy working around the fiat money. Why fiat money exists at all, and what it has to do with inflation, is an important topic in our next chapter. Value-Free Economics So far, we have avoided loaded, lo loaded terms such as free market, competitive economy, free trade, fair trade, and so on. The Austrian economists, Menger von Mises, Eugene von Bombarek, and their students believed economics economics should be a science free of such terms a value free science science has values try to engage in research without a commitment to truth or an affinity for reality many people hold values that are impossible to achieve in reality and are frustrated they hurt themselves many people seek to gain values by misrepresenting reality to others when they are challenged they accuse the exposers of holding different competing values Thus, value-free scientists, including economic, uh, economists, find they, can they cannot remain forever neutral in their ivory towers. To the extent, though, that they try by keeping their own subjective values out of the way, they do accomplish, mu accomplish much. The scientific method works, and being able to tell people that stealing from everyone and then giving it back to them will make them less well-off is useful, not matter how unpopular. This is where the application of economics enters. About the author. Samuel Edward Konkin III was a vanguard movement theorist and a hardcore activist since the historic split between libertarians and conservatives at the YAF convention in St. Louis, 1969. In the subsequent three and a half decades, he served as editor and publisher of the longest-lived libertarian publication beginning as a laissez-faire, 1970, then as New Libertarian Notes, 1971-75, to New Libertarian Weekly, 1975 to 77, the longest running libertarian weekly, and New Libertarian, 1978 to 1990. He wrote the seminal work on agorism, New Libertarian Manifesto, in 1980. He has coined the following terms and concepts, many of which have turned up in all libertarian publications counter economics, agorism, minarchy, partyarchy, anti principles, left libertarianism, anarcho Zionism, brownout, red market octopus, and more. He has influenced the work of authors such as J. Neil Shulman, alongside Knight, and Victor Komen, Solomon's Knife, who both had their first professional fiction sales in the pages of his publications. Mr. Konkin served as a executive director of the Agorist Institute, an outreach organization promulgating the principles of agorism and counter-economics. He was guest of honor at science fiction conventions and libertarian gatherings, and was a seasoned world traveler. His unfinished magnum opus, Counter Economics, will see publication in the near future. Mr. Konkin died February 23rd, 2004. You've just heard An Agorist Primer by Samuel Edward Konkin III, otherwise known as SEK3. Read to you by Kyle Reardon from the Last Bastille blog and Shane Radliff from Liberty Under Attack. We surely, surely hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Chapter 2. Applied Economics Agorism is more than economics, but Agorist thinking is impossible without that basic understanding. Just applying the basic economics we have learned so far can sweep away a lot of misconceptions and eliminate a lot of confusion about how the world works. We also can deal with some of the misleading con jobs of economics. However, explaining why economics is so twisted will have to wait until we apply libertarianism later. The free market. Agorism upholds the free market. To understand why, one first needs to know what the free market is and what its alternatives are. Again, why is left for later. The term agorism is derived from the ancient Greek word agora, meaning an open marketplace. The market is not a single place or center. Goods and services are exchanged at the corner store on the stock exchange, at a swap meet, in your backyard or across the internet. Playing a game with a friend is not a market transaction, but foregoing the time that each of, you could spend, each of you could spend on working or buying or selling is a market transaction. 
all social interaction has a market component. Economics may be far more pervasive than we thought. It is difficult to imagine how we could have a free society, should we wish it, without a free market. Perhaps we should be clear with reference to what we mean by free. Free means the absence of coercion. Coercion is threatening violence upon someone in order to make him surrender something. In a strictly value-free sense, then, coercive human action offers to create a greater disvalue to you if you do not yield up your lesser value. You gain nothing, but lose less. Repeated application of coercion destroys values. The coercer gains without producing anything of value and the victim always loses. Voluntary exchange, as we, as we have seen, occurs when both feel a gain and subjective value. Unease is relieved in both directions. In coercive transactions, unease is increased. Retrieving your goods from the coercer with the threat of greater force and enough extra for your time and trouble at least wipes out your loss, although it leaves the original coercer with a net loss. At that point, he may finally become aware of the value destruction of coercion. Or he may simply decide he, st he needs still greater force. The biggest force of all in an area is usually the state, but we'll come to that later. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, the free market is the absence of all that coercion. If there were only a few private thieves, and they were usually apprehended and forced to make restitution, something very close to a free market would exist. People would have locks, fences, alarms, and insurance policies, and protection agent policies, but would act otherwise on the assumption that they were free to give up their property to those of their choice and accept from others who gave freely, freely to them. They could not plan on people changing their minds, but they could make contracts, exchanging a good here and now for one to be given later, so that if others changed their minds, some compensation would result. Planning and Chaos it quickly becomes clear that planning is far more practical in a free market than in a coerced market. If coercion becomes regular and predictable, innovative people find ways around it and soon enough join forces to evade the coercive regulations, frustrating and or starving the coercer. So new forms of coercion must be brought in and economic planning is disrupted once again. Some argue that a free market is chaos. They see no one giving orders, and so think that there is no order. In reality, a completely free market is a highly de decentralized order. Each cog in the great machine keeps itself well-oiled and seeks to mesh, mesh, mesh itself with other cogs in ever body fits. An even better example is the human body. While the brain has some overall direction, it cannot instruct various cells to go about their ways delivering blood and building tissues and contracting muscle and transmitting energy. A disease or parasite may direct some cells to a common task, but this results in a disruption of the natural order. Even without a foreign invader, if the brain could force some cells to act other than naturally, the entire body would suffer by this imposed order, and the body could die. The fallacy in planned economics is the error of assuming that order is imposed. Scientists are aware that order is something you look for in nature, it's already there. Economics tells us that attempts to impose order by coercion are destructive and chaotic, yet economic planning of the imposing kind is common to nearly all schools of economics. We begin to see where the gap between economics, lowercase e, and, up, uh, and economics, uppercase e, lies. Competition and monopoly. It's nice if more than one person offers to trade the same thing with you. You usually can get a better deal. When more than one seller, sellers offer, when more than one seller offers identical goods, and when more than one buyer offers to acquire the same goods, pure competition exists. If only one buyer or seller is available, the buyer or seller is said to have a monopoly. Competition is always good in the sense that it maximizes value exchanges. Although it would take more theory to prove this, most people have had enough experience to accept the, the foregoing as a factual statement. Surely not all monopoly is bad? If we banned all monopoly, then Leonardo da Vinci would have had to give up painting what, he only, he, what only he can paint. And the Beatles would have had to stop composing what only they can compose. 
In fact, since a little bit of artistry distinguishes all goods, pure competition is impossible. There are no ident identical products. Yet, for your subjective purposes, you can see no difference worth paying for among all sorts of goods. And they do not have, they do not have to all be that similar. With $15, you might decide to buy a book you wish to spend the evening with. Finding the book sold, you consider a movie instead. The lines are too long, so you buy a six-pack instead and go home. Someone else would have different goods competing for that $15, even if you had started out trying to buy that same book. If I told you at this point that some economists defined a free market as a perfectly competitive market, you might wonder when they lost their senses. After all, if people want to produce different things, remember division of labor, and are more productive doing so, you will not get perfect competition in the free market. You will have lots of competition by giving each human actor maximum freedom to explore his values and find alternatives. Now, if I tell you that these economists say that if a market is not perfectly competitive, force should be used to make it so. You probably are beginning to wonder if I have not lost my senses. Whatever these economists are after, it is not a free market, nor will they generate any gains since values are always net destroyed by coercion. Adam Smith defined monopoly as a grant of exclusive trading by the king. It was a royal privilege, that is, the state coerced some people not to produce goods when the king's friend was already doing so. Breaking up these forced monopolies was an issue for freedom lovers, and rightfully so. The problems arose when people stopped thinking clearly, or had their thoughts muddled by economists. Monopoly became bad, not because it was coercive, but because it was not competitive. Clear thinking and consistency led us easily to realize that the opposite of forced monopoly and forced coercion, forced competition, is natural monopoly and free competition. The correct opposition is that the coerced market is the coerced market versus the free market. Cartels. One problem with monopoly we seem to have overlooked. Do not the big get bigger and the small get driven out, even if the market is left alone? The answer is obvious, imp obvious empirically. Historically, it has never happened. There is extensive literature by the better sort of economists on many net historical examples where businesses were accused of forming trusts. That is, attempting to monopolize one industry through cartels. Most cases, when state trustbusters were brought in to break up a large company, proved to have been instigated by smaller companies against a more efficient competitor. Cartels, as Dr. Murray Rothbard has beautifully shown, tend to break up from market forces. The most efficient cartel member can outshell his fellow members and has a tremendous incentive to cheat on the cartel agreement. He can steal the customers from his fellow members and soon does under the table. Upon discovery, his fellow cartel members fight back by cutting prices and the cartel disintegrates. In a coerced market, however, the cartel will run to someone to force compliance with the cartel. That someone is, in any realistic unfree market, the state. And once again, we are back to the forced or state monopoly. Profit and Enterprise Sometimes the terms free enterprise and capitalism are used to mean free market. Capitalism means the ideology ism of capital or capitalists. Before Marx came along, the pure free marketeer Thomas Hodgkin had already used the term capitalism as a pejorative. Capitalists were trying to use coercion, the state, to restrict the market. Capitalism then does not describe a free market, but a form of statism, like communism. Free enterprise can only exist in a free market and is an acceptable, sentiment, uh, acceptable synonym. Yet, while the term market covers all human transactions, enterprise seems limited to certain types of businesses. And what about profit? Is it the result of exploitation, enterprise, hard work, or something else? Applying economic, no economic knowledge here resolves the problem clearly, but it will take little effort to follow through. According to Austrian economics, there are three productive functions in the marketplace, labor, capital, and entrepreneur entrepreneurship. In the simplest primitive economy, capital consists of tools, food you have stored to keep you going until your harvest comes in, or you can sell the shoes you made and storefronts or wagons to take your goods to the market. Labor is the work you put into farming or shoemaking or whatever. 
entrepreneurship is direction, the reins of the operation, deciding where to invest the capital, and which and how many workers to hire. As the market progresses to greater wealth and complexity, we can see that the important components of entrepreneurship are risk-taking and innovation. Spe uh, speculators, inventors, and artists, without patrons, are the best-known, fairly pure entrepreneurs. They take risks, create a product that did not exist before, which turns out to have a demand. Two, a better product to, re to replace one that existed before, winning away the demand. Three, a cheaper method of producing or marketing the same product, again, winning away the demand. The gain resulting from pure entrepreneurship is profit. It is not, every, it's not the everyday return on investment that a businessman counts over his expensive expenses and takes home. Windfall profits occur when there's a sudden change in market conditions, such as weather wiping, weather, wipe, weather wiping out crops or producing bumper harvests, mineral and oil strikes suddenly coming onto the market when the market is not free, sudden government interference in the marketplace. Those who make the most effort to anticipate the unexpected trend to make the most profits. Taking risks also means one can introduce products no one wants, invent devices that are laughed away, and create artsy trash. Such creations incur negative profit, loss, and alas, this is at least the common, at least as common historically as profit. Nonetheless, without entrepreneurship, enterprise, the economy would stagnate as people continue investing the same capital in the same way over and over, and workers continue at the same jobs. When skilled laborers begin to die out and capital runs out of components, such as minerals and mines or new forests for timber, the economy would regress and collapse. Everyone is part laborer, pan-capitalist, and part entrepreneur. But by division of labor, we tend to specialize. There is nothing to prevent us from all being wealthy someday at any rate, and using our money, as James, Garner, as James Garner put it so well in the film The Wheeler Dealers, as a way of keeping score in capital investment. And capital in the form of ever more intelligent computers can reduce labor to vestigial activity, as necessary as the human appendix. Entrepreneurship, on the other hand, is increased, not decreased, by a progressive market. As our society becomes more complex and more wealthy, more people will specialize in entrepreneurial activity, and more people must be free to do so. Entrepreneurship cannot be forced. When bureaucrats plan, they spend their time finding ways of covering their posteriors and pass the losses on to the taxpayers. They fear replacement, and since they reap little or no reward for success, they become timid about actually taking risks and spend their time creating red tape entanglements designed to stimmy innovation. Regulation. There is nothing positive to say about regulation. Regulation, regulation is coercion. It prevents subjective values from being satisfied, protecting only those who do not wish to be protected, and penalizing only the law-abiding. Regulation destroys uh, initiative and stifles innovation. Regulation stagnates markets. Regulation can and does kill people when the regulators deny victims the right to take a chance with so-called risky medication. Regulation is motivated by fear, envy, and colossal ignorance. There is nothing that can protect innocent people more than a thorough education and a vigorous pursuit of fraud. Yet, regulation of advertising and experimentation destroys information transfer and regulation of quality merely certifies incompetent professionals and protects them from fraud charges. If all the regulation passed in any country you wish to name were completely obeyed, let alone enforced, we would all be dead. Consider a particularly pathological case in the United States of America. If you charge a price for your product higher than your competitors, this is taken as evidence under the Sherman Antitrust, Antitrust Act that you have a monopoly and charges may be brought against you. The same problem arises if you charge the same. That is considered evidence of a cartel, and you and your competitors can all be fined. Finally, if you charge less than your competitors, you are violating the fair trade laws in most states and can be arrested and fined. It is impossible to obey all the regulations. Taxation. There is a serious moral question about taxation that we will leave for later. 
Let it suffice now to recognize that taxation takes something from someone against his or her will and is a violation of his or her subjective rules. Any specific form of tax taxation directs resources counter-entrepreneurially. In short, taxation has no place in a free market. Interest. There are three very, very closely related concepts in economics, and they have to do with capital, land, and money. It is often said that capital earns a rate of return on investment. Remember, only entrepreneurs make profits. Land earns rent, and money earns interest. With an efficient medium of exchange, an entrepreneur will quickly shift from capital goods of one type to another if the rate of return is higher in one sector of the market than the other. Land is a fixed form of capital, and if we are in a free market, we should expect rent to come to equal the rate of return as in other, in other investments, assuming no risks where profit would be added or subtracted. And so it, so it is with interest. Originary interest is what money earns if you lend it out to an entrepreneur risk-free. Should you accept risk yourself, you may add on a risk component, a form of profit. At the same level of risk in a highly developed market, interest rates would stabilize and slowly decrease as wealth increases. Only if something becomes powerful enough, coercive enough, to monopolize by force all the media of exchange or money supply and then, and, and then increase it so that the value of each unit declines, will another component appear to increase the interest rate regardless of risk. Conceivably, it could decrease the, decrease the money supply so that the value would be expected to increase and interest to be discounted. In an extreme sense, this inflationary component could drive interest rates to zero, or negative, that is, someone pays you to take his money and give it back to him later. Deflation is rare, as there is very little incentive for controllers, controllers of the money supply to deflate. Inflation Understanding how inflation works and what to do about it made the fortunes of the gold bugs and investment analysis mentioned earlier. While there is considerable fog and confusion thrown around this subject, inflation is simply enough to understand if you follow our step-by-step -step logic and always watch out for it, watch for inconsistencies. From Chapter 1, we know what money is. Free market money could be affected by, by, say, a gold strike, or if for some reason gold was all kept in a Fort Knox by James Bond's goldfinger, nuking it. Even then, there would be a brief dip or jump in the price of gold. The price of money is simply the inverse of the prices of everything bought with it, and stability would resume at the new level. In a worldwide market, the effect, even of nuking Fort Knox, would be barely noticeable. Inflation is the increase of the money supply. Inflation results only when the most powerful force in society, the state, commands a monopolistic fiat money system, creates legal tender laws, legal tender compels the monopoly, contracts are not upheld, and other tender or money. And, with army and police to back it up, debases a form of money that was acceptable in the marketplace. States that have imposed fiat money from scratch, such as in the newly emerging third, newly emerging third world countries, find their money rapidly rejected in favor of foreign currency and gold. The usual rate of inflation, usual route, of inf route to inflation takes four steps. One, replacement of money by certificates for the money. A weight of gold, gold or silver is replaced by a certificate claiming an ounce of gold or a pound of silver in some precious metal warehouse or bank. Two, legal definition of possession of this certificate as equivalent to possessing the wealth. The government gets into the act. 3. Restriction of all exchanges, save pr primitive bartering, to the legal certificates. This is the creation of legal tender. 4. Issuing certificates without money to back them up. At this point, we have fiat money and inflation. Inflation leads to crack-up booms, German in 1923, and depressions, U.S. in 1929. This analysis is a bit more complicated and is best left to the more cataclysmic scenarios we'll present near the end of the book. Oh, and as you probably guessed, one result of inflation is a general rise in price level. Notice that some prices rise faster than others, and some even seem to drop. Only the distortion is common to all price changes. <clears throat> a little knowledge. If you have mastered the first two chapters, congratulations. You will quickly discover two things by simply reading your daily newspaper or news blog or shooting the breeze with your acquaintances. First, 
you will discover the appalling level of ignorance with which most of society is afflicted. Be careful, some people get very irritable when challenged by someone who knows what he is talking about. A knowledgeable person might be tempted to use his knowledge to bulk the, to bulk the ignorant. Many people with only a little knowledge do just that. However, there are moral ways to profit by your understanding, and by all means, go to it. Second, you'll discover that the appalling web of statism is controlling, or attempting to control, nearly every aspect of human action. You will probably feel smothered, and that is not surprising. You may also feel like giving up and giving in, but survival alone dictates otherwise. Survival, let alone prosperity, demands that you tear through the web of legislation and follow nature's laws instead. You must abandon economics to the regulators and the political businessmen who play ball with them. You are left with the alternative, stifle your, left with the alternative, stifle yourself and starve or embrace counter-economics. Chapter 6. Applied Libertarianism. A Brief History of Liberty. The history of the libertarian movement can be divided into four historical periods. The first covered most of our history, when many men and women derived the ideas of freedom and defended freedom as they understood it, with little comprehension of the mechanics of human action. Some of these, such as the Quakers of Pennsylvania, settled colonies away from predatory statism and developed peace and trade with the natives. The American Revolution erupted the year that Adam Smith published the first basic work on economics. Still, the confused American revolutionaries allowed the Federalist statists to restore a strong central government by a bit of trickery called the Constitution, a piece of paper which supposedly guaranteed to restrain the new state. Most of the revolutionaries, nearly all the signers of the Declaration of Independence, for instance, opposed the Constitution. Many Americans were taken in by the statist selling job and laid down their arms that were defending them practically in exchange for the paper guarantee. As soon as the new government was elected, it sent the military to Pennsylvania to crush the tax rebels who opposed the new tax on whiskey distillation. In England soon after, a man named William Godwin took the political ideas of the American revolutionaries to their logical conclusion and became the first anarchist. In the 1830s, European intellectual scene a man named Max Stirner combined anarchy with defense of the free market, as far as Adam Smith understood it then, and created a philosophy of egoism or total individualism. For a time, he contested with Marx and Engels for the loyalty of the young Hegelians in the German clubs. They wrote a two-volume defense of their theory against Stirner, the German ideology. In the United States, Joshua Warren continued the anarchist tradition in Massachusetts. One of his abolitionist followers, Lysander Spooner, finally developed a killing against the U.S. state in his remarkable natural law treatise, No Treason, the Constitution of No Authority. Alas, it was nearly a century late because the state was entrenched well enough to fight a civil war to destroy the remaining internal restraints on its power, namely under the pretext of expanding freedom by abolishing slavery. Spooner saw through that smokescreen and supported both abolition and secession of the southern states. His follower, Benjamin Tucker, discovered Stirner's European individualism and combined the two traditions. The heyday of individualist anarchism during the publication of Tucker's Liberty magazine from 1881 to 1908 could be called the second stage of libertarianism. George Bernard Shaw, for example, broke into the American literary scene through Liberty. The full title of Tucker's journal was Liberty, the Mother, Not the Daughter of Order. Tucker still had problems with economics, not understanding subjective value or the validity of rent, interest, and profit. While willing to accept anything arrived at freely, he and his associates spent their energies on side issues and invalid controversies. When World War I broke out, they lost the center stage of history to the socialists for half a century. At the same time that Tucker himself 
about uh, <laughs> giving up. Brilliant Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises wrote his doctoral thesis in 1910, The Theory of Money and Credit, which explained interest, inflation, and business cycles. His analysis led to an easy explanation and prediction of the Great Depression, but it went unheeded. In 1949, Mises published his magnum opus, Human Action. Along the way, he sent the communist economists into a panic by proving that economic calculation was impossible once socialist status destroyed the free market pricing system. During the 1920s and 30s, proto-libertarians such as H.L. Mencken and Albert J. Nock kept the philosophy alive, but in despair. One of Nock's students, Frank Chodorov, reached one of Mises' students, Murray Rothbard. In 1950, Rothbard connected with the American anarchist tradition and the, modern, <laughs> and the modern libertarian stage began. Another of Knox's students, Suzanne Lafollette, inspired many modern libertarian feminists. More women, Rose Wilder Lane and Isabel Patterson, kept libertarianism alive in the 1940s. For 20 years, Rothbard tirelessly sold his consistent libertarian view in intellectual circles and was purged from the right, from objectivists, from the left and various other groups, always taking a few more with him, never despairing. In 1969, during the heat of the student revolt against the Vietnam War and the draft, both the leftist Students for a Democratic Society and the rightist Young Americans for Freedom split internally. The anarchists from SDS joined the free marketeers from YAF at a convention called by Dr. Rothbard, and thousands of young activists were unleashed on the campuses to fight for pure freedom. Within a few years, there were a million libertarians in North America and small groups from England to Spain to Australia. Libertarians graduated and started businesses or entered the higher levels of academy, bringing reinforcements to Dr. Rothbard of his previously small core. Libertarian reporters, authors, and even newscasters spread through the media. Robert Lefebvre, another libertarian educator contemporary with Rothbard, graduated hundreds of businessmen from his seminars and thousands from Rampart College. Leonard Reed and his crew reached many from all walks of life at the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE. New foundations and institutes sprang up. Early in 1971, a group of Californians started a libertarian party as a front for distribution of literature and appeal for equal time on local media. In December of 1971, David F. Nolan convened a founding convention of a libertarian party in deadly earnest. Rothbard scoffed at the idea of a party as widely premature. In 1972, an LP presidential candidate got few votes, but thanks to a renegade Republican elector from Virginia, John Hospers, professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California, received one electoral vote. His running mate, Tony Nathan of Oregon became the first woman to receive one. The elector, Roger McBride, became the LP nominee for president in 1976. The LP emerged from two sources, impatience and inconsistency. In 1972, the student movement collapsed, but the graduates needed years to affect society by working their way through the system and building alternatives outside it. This desire to achieve results now get rich quick, was expressed in the return of many who had rejected the status system to re-enter it, though most of those entering the LP were not the politically cynical old-timers. The more raw recruits to libertarianism had little direct experience with politics, and so accepted arguments that the party would spread the word to people by <laughs> used to receiving it via the biennial electoral process. While half the LP recruiters swore that the LP was an educational tool and would never win an election and take power, the other half promised the replacement of the Republicans by the new party and the transformation of society from the top down. During 1973, the party threat became serious and the libertarian movement began to split. The anti-party libertarians called themselves various names such as New Libertarians, left, more consistently radical, libertarians, radical libertarians, and exotic names such as voluntarists. The common goal of these activists was to deflect the party anti-principle. 
in the minds and hearts of most libertarians and pursue the original goals of liberty in libertarian, that is, anti-political ways. The party arcs, as those who professed being ruled by a party yet called themselves anarchists were then called, and their minarchist allies were small in number but did have an advantage in getting newspaper and television coverage. Radical libertarian campaigns, such as the 1976 Vote for Nobody counter campaign, received publicity on several hundred radio stations, and 50% of registered American voters failed to cast ballots. More and more pure libertarians gave up on the label as the word was increasingly identified with a group out to take political power, as opposed to abolishing it. The new libertarians found that many who would agree to live freely in trade without aggression were repelled by the libertarian name. Finally, in 1983, the movement of the libertarian left, the new libertarian alliance, and others moved to drop the libertarian label entirely. Some chose the name voluntarism. Those wishing to promote the completely consistent ideology described in this book chose the name agorist. During the 1973 struggle, the challenges for an alternative strategy to politics were answered by the NLA founder who discovered and coined the term counter-economics, see chapter 3. In 1980, the NLA published New Libertarian Manifesto, which explained agorism and beyond to libertarian activists. The Libertarian Failure Libertarians were, and still are, a pluralistic group. Different interpretations of liberty and how to achieve it were cheerfully tolerated for the most part. The appearance of a party line was anathema to the spirit of living variety. The burning issue shifted from which new libertarian theory works and which does not to which libertarian candidate can get elected. To many, libertarianism was a fine theory which had no obvious practice. There are many paths to freedom, true, and each individual should choose the one that they think most workable. One that was chosen swallowed up the others. How it did was simple. It tied into the state's grant of monopoly to ideologies that form a centralized political party, and then spokespersons of that ideology were automatically representatives, servitors, or functionaries of that party, even when they vigorously deny any connection by the statist media. And then again, maybe not. Libertarian may have come to mean LP member, but agorists, voluntarists, left libertarians, and such still outnumber the few thousand LP members and even the never since matched million votes their candidate Edward Clark received in the 1980 US presidential race. Whether or not libertarianism failed and died, perverted, so near to 1984, which was uh, Orwell's deadline for tyranny's triumph in the form of an all-powerful party, or was simply a stage in the evolution of agorism, building a theory to explain and morally defend counter-economics is, well, a moot point. Both positions are, in a sense, true. Agorism is here and viable for those who wish to live as freely as possible now and increase their free freedom in the future. What now calls itself libertarian cannot honestly offer that anymore. Those who understand this will reject the Libertarian Party and other political solutions to the statist problem. Those who accept the LP will waste their time, energy, and wealth in building a new means of keeping people in bondage under the thumb of the state. The Libertarian Insight and Fallacy Libertarian theory provided a crucial insight as to why counter-economics was morally correct as well as, obviously, practical and very profitable. The crucial issue is that of the state, its nature, and its evolution. The easiest paradigm, short model, for the origin of the state was offered by Franz Oppenheimer, a German sociologist and adopted into American libertarianism in Albert J. Knox's 1935 book, Our Enemy, the State. All historical examples fit this simple paradigm. When most of humanity settled into peaceful farming communities with perhaps larger marketplaces, remember the original agora of Greece and towns, some people discovered a means of surviving parasitically from the productivity of others. They formed robber bands and attacked towns and settlements, plundering, raping, and murdering. Probably the original barbarian hordes were hunters who took to hunting man when their game died out rather than taking to farming, trading, or productive manufacture. These roving groups were a small minority, or their victims would have died out and they as well, but large as compared to a single town or village. Somewhere along the way, one of them discovered that they could allow the peasants to live with enough to survive on and come back at the next harvest for another raid. 
Then these raiders had another idea. They would stay in the same towns, steal lightly but regularly, murder enough to keep the peasants and merchants in line, and live well. Other areas, seeing these uh, <laughs> petty kingdoms arise, decided to submit themselves to their own homegrown warlords so they would not fall prey to foreign warriors. The book of Samuel in the Old Testament describes the anarchist prophet Samuel trying to convince the Israelites that they didn't really want a king, but finally giving in to them. Parasites must remain a minority or kill their hosts. So they, they, <laughs> so they discovered religion and later ideology as a means to intimidate peasants and win the all-important sanction of the victim, an apt phrase of Ayn Rand's. Brutal thugs became kings by divine right, and some very powerful status called emperors, pharaohs, or czars were said to be divine, the unstoppable choice of gods. And so these barbarian raiders institutionalized plunder, taxation, murder, execution, and warfare, and even rape, droit de signer, for example. They took control of roads to plunder the caravans, tolls, tariffs, they suppressed all rival criminal gangs with their own, police, and established their own churches, schools, judges, and even philosophers, minstrels, and artists to work in their royal courts. Thus was born the state. As people come to understand this situation, especially important questions of conscience, split religions and ideologies, dissidents grew. The state learned to survive by adapting. It used its court thinkers, intellectuals, to come up with new ways of mystifying the people. The kings limited themselves and shared their plunder with aristocrats and certain favored merchants. Thus was born mercantilism, which Adam Smith challenged. Then even peasants and workers were permitted to plunder their fellow merchants, farmers, and workers. This was called democracy. Groups were allowed to organize to fight over who should steal from whom, though an elite of bureaucrats and very rich businessmen continue no matter who is elected, and thus reform political parties. The libertarian analysis superbly explained the political history of the world and, combined with free market economics, analyzed depressions, modern warfare, and revolutions, describing their causes and predicting the futility of political solutions. When libertarianism began to organize itself, though, much of the movement was bought off with yet another political party. To understand the libertarian fallacy, consider its insight in other terms. Oppenheimer and Nock pointed out there were only two ways to acquire wealth, food, shelter, tools, entertainment. One could produce some and trade for others, or one could steal those produced. Those are all the choices there are. They named the productive way the economic means, and the parasitic way the political means. Murray Rothbard, following Ludwig von Mises' Human Action with his own economic treatise, Man, Economy, and State, added that insight onto Austrian economics in the final chapters. The demand for elucidation was so great that he wrote, in detail, an entire book on the subject, Power and Market. It is amazing that for a time, even Dr. Rothbard forgot his own lesson. The choice was power politics versus market economics. Using political means to achieve free market ends is self-destructive and self-defeating. The recognition of the libertarian incompa incompatibility of status means to anti-status ends was the first agorist insight. Following that, the new agorists looked for the proper means to achieve a free society, or at least a fully libertarian society. They sought market means only. The author of this book and his companions found the counter-economy staring them in the face as soon as they thought of looking. Chapter 7. Agorism. To understand agorism fully, and to compare it to, to competing ways of thinking, one needs to know two things about it, its goal and its path to that goal. This knowledge is critical to evaluating all ideologies. The goal is living in the agora, and the path is expanding counter-economics. Remember our constant, if not nagging, emphasis on consistency, both internally and with reality. Agorism must have a path consistent with its goal and a goal consistent with its path. The axioms of agorism. A free society is the goal of many people, not all of them agorists or even libertarians. Agorists can see nothing but a free market and a free society. After all, who or what will prevent it? 
The first axiom of agorism. The closest approach to a free society is an uncorrupted agora, open marketplace. An axiom is a principle or premise of a way of thinking. It is arrived at by, the, by insight, induction, and observation of nature. Theorems are arrived at deductively from axioms. The zero with axiom of agorism might be there are no contradictions in reality and theory must be consistent with reality. Commonly known axioms in philosophy are existence exists and A is A. Well-known mathematical axioms are things equal to another thing are equal to each other and a statement leading to a contradiction with a theorem or axiom is false. The first six chapters of this primer preceded the actual presentation of agorism to give you, the reader, enough understanding of economics, counter-economics, and libertarianism to see from where the insights that produced agorism were derived. They were not chosen arbitrarily, but, but rather as a result of years of bitter experience and, in some cases, furious battles and acts of resistance. The hardcore agorists had to have something worth dying for and, far more important, worth living for. The second axiom of agorism. The agora self-corrects for small perturbations of corruption. This axiom leads us to a far more detailed picture of what our nearly free society would look like. It means simply that free market entities will defend the free market. People have to choose to do it, of course, but the incentive, offering of subjective, subjective value satisfaction, will be present to motivate them to do so and will be sufficient to motivate enough people to do so. Occasional criminals will be discovered, sought, found, apprehended, tried, sentenced, compelled to deliver restitution, and if possible, deterred from further actions. The third axiom of agorism. The moral system of any agora is compatible with pure libertarianism. This axiom means that life and property are, are safe from all those who act morally in this, in this society. We will describe this in the next section. But let us complete the axioms first. The fourth axiom of, agor of agorism. Agora in part is agora in whole. To a workable approximation, the corruption of an agora raises protection costs and risks. This axiom's use will become blindingly clear when we deal with the path. Agorism is more theory, but it is derived from these axioms. For the professional logicians, tripping across the theory for the first time, I need to add a fifth axiom for completion. Agorism qua theory is an open system. This simply means that we may discover and add on other axioms, that then check to see how consistent they are with what we already have. The goal of Agora. With that short burst of hard philosophy in the last section, we are ready to picture the society we are aiming for. The goal of Agorism is the Agora. The society of the open marketplace, as near to untainted by theft, assault and fraud as can be humanly attained, is as close to a free society as can be achieved. And a free society is the only one in which each and every one of us can satisfy his or her subjective values without crushing others' values by violence and coercion. It's a bit late to notice, perhaps, but if your highest values require murder and theft, you will not like the Agora. Still, you have not wasted your time as you have just read an introduction to the thinking of your worst enemy. Science fiction has given us many convincing portrayals of future societies, from the grotesquely tyrannical 1984 to the transitional to freedom. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, Kings of the High Frontier, to actual free market anarchies that accidentally arose. The Syndic, The Great Explosion, The Probability Brooch. One even portrayed a likely scenario for an Agorist revolution, alongside Knight. Still, we cannot predict or foresee all the changes. Fortunately, we can get a good picture of an Agorist society by picking out those changes from our present state of societies that must occur or we simply don't have Agorism. Our axioms give us that much. States will be gone. Roads will be run by competing market companies and kept in repair for a change to attract more customers. Then again, cars may levitate over the roads for all we know or fly or take tunnels to preserve scenery. If we can think of one good reason to do something some way, in a free market it will be tried and many ways will work at the same time for different reasons. The post office will be gone and mail, if not replaced by, replaced by email entirely, will be efficiently and cheaply delivered ever faster. War will be gone. Defense budgets will be gone. Taxes will be gone. You will pay for what you get only when you want it, unless what you want is a gift. I repeat and cannot emphasize enough, or wax floridly enough, the opportunities and freedom explode into the unimaginable. The sheer complexity of all possible choice moves to the infinite as restrictions approach zero. Let us focus very narrowly on only one business in the totally free marketplace. Justice. Justice is a business. It's not free. 
someone must pay for its workings. Well, justice in the abstract is not an economic question. Remember the word fray of chapter one. The obtaining of justice is an economic service. Consider this illustration. Your completely tricked out media center is stolen from your home. You notify laissez-faire insurance and protection company immediately. As fast as modern technology permits, you receive an identical screen, receiver, game station, speakers, cables, and a sack full of remotes to replace the original, with downloads of any programs you missed in the interim. You have achieved full restoration of your subjective value to the condition it would have been had there had been no act of aggression. Surely that is the goal of justice. Now how is this paid for in a free market, consistently with our understanding of economics and libertarian morality? The moral position first. You delegate LFI and PC as your agent to use defensive force to regain your missing property and all expenses occurred. If LFI and PC uh, to attempt, uh, attempt to extract any more from the ultimately caught thief, they're on their own. The thief's insurance and protection company is entitled to defend the thief. Costs are paid for in three ways. First, as insurance. A small number of criminals may elude, may, may elude even the highly efficient, super technological, extremely competitive protection agencies of the Agora's future. Insurance is simply sharing the risk of something happening with all of the others subscribing to LFI and PC. As the odds of a thief getting away, getting away with it approaches zero, your premium approach is zero. Second, as protection. You install locks and detectors, alarms, and maybe even booby traps. Actually, since your premiums will go down as you, as you make yourself aggression proof, aggression proof, protection will incur minimal additional costs. Third, as restitution. The aggressor, when apprehended, pays LFI and PC, the cost of replacement of the purloined or damaged goods, interest for the time the goods were stolen, any costs related to apprehension, including fees for investigators, arresting agents, arbitrators, market judges, and if still necessary, enforcer charges to reclaim your property. Note all the differences between statism and, agor and agorism. First, in a state, you can expect nothing from the police if you report a criminal. Maybe someday you'll get your property back if the criminal is ever caught, and when, th when they're through using the components as evidence. Since the odds of police accomplishing this are less than 10%, your insurance premiums, if the government still allows insurance companies, Reflect the sharing of the high risk of theft, plus whatever taxes the state tax on, plus the inefficiencies and additional costs of government regulation of the insurance industry. Did you ever try to collect insurance? Notice the form filing in red tape, just like any other government bureaucracy imposed on a supposedly free enterprise. Second, in a state, you're under the control of the state in a criminal proceeding, even though you are the victim. You'll be told when to appear, where to go, and you'll be forced to see the case through, even if you change your mind. In the Agora, should the matter go to arbitration, you'll be required to report your loss since you want it replaced. That's all. The theft may even have been recorded on video, but even if not, the protection company's detectives do all the work. You stand back or go about your business and let them do their jobs. That's all. You may never be called again, even if the thief is caught, convicted, and compelled to provide restitution. If LFI and PC needs more tes testimony from you, they will ask you to attend the arbitration, and if they err, they will pay for the error. Should they need you inordinately, they will pay you for your trouble, or they will let you go and lose the case if you want too much, of, too much for your time. Third, in a state, everything is monopolized. Your appeal to, is to another judge who works for the state, too. In the Agora, competition and choice is everywhere. There are plenty of insurance and protection companies from which to choose, all eager for your business. They can choose from a number of crack, de crack detectives, all competing to show that they are the best investigators. Should the matter go to arbitration, a number of arbitrators are competing for the positions, hoping to prove themselves the fairest and most worthy of your company's hire. Furthermore, if crime risks go up in your neighborhood, it is in the interest of your protection company and those companies of your neighbors to hire protectors or guards to patrol your area. Unless you attack your neighbor, their protectors will never threaten you. Fourth, in a state, your police protection is just that is likely to arrest, like, likely to arrest you for some crime that is no victim. There are no such victimless crimes in the Agora. Fifth, the rights of the victim, you, can never be overridden by the rights of the real criminal. Under Agora's justice, the arbitrator rules on the evidence that you are or are not entitled to restitution of goods or even parts of the body as technology makes that possible. 
interest for time lost, and your protection agency's expenses, including detection and apprehension costs. The moment the line is crossed into extracting more from the media center thief than full restoration of your components and all costs incurred, you or your company become the aggressor and the ex-thief's protection agency will now honor its contract to defend him. All insurance and protection contracts in an Agora society will stipulate, stipulate that you cannot be protected from restoration proceedings after the protection company has defended you up to a fair arbitration. This idea, this ideal seldom lived up to by the states, is called due process. The difference between Agora's protection and state policing has many more characteristics, but this list gives you a good idea. There is nothing the state can offer you in moral protection that the market cannot offer and the free market will function faster and better than the state. It's true that an occasional market company may be unsound, but you always have the option of switching to a better competitor. Under a state, you know your protection service will always be the same. Poor with no alternative. The state offers one thing the free market cannot and will not offer. Aggression. If you wish to attack your immediate neighbors, you'll need state police to attack them for the crimes of belonging to the wrong religious group, or of taking the wrong intoxicant, or of performing sex in a way of which you disapprove. And of course, your neighbors will need state police to attack you for the similar reasons. If you want to attack far away, far away neighbors, you need, an, you need a state army. Or maybe you want to live in peace and freedom and will be satisfied with protection and defense. Two words or so about national defense. Full agorism obviously needs no national defense. There are no nations to defend and no nations from which to be defended. Local protection against occasional criminals is sufficient. Once in a while, criminals might band together to overwhelm a single protection company. Then the Agorist Protection Agency merely needs to hire another protection company to assist it. Similarly, should one protection company go bad, a few of the hundreds of others would be enough to apprehend its agents and shut it down. But in fact, market forces would sap such a company's destructive power long before it came to that. People raised in an Agora society would stop paying its insurance premiums and ship to its competitors. Detective and investigation agencies would terminate their contracts with it. Arbitrators would consistently rule against its aggressive moves. Agents working for the company would quit and go elsewhere. Secretaries and office help would walk out rather than have their reputation sullied by associating with such un types. Even restaurants and grocery stores would refuse to sell to the renegades or would hike their prices to show their additional loss of subjective value in dealing with such coercive filth. Perhaps the company turning, company turning state would pay higher prices to hold onto their employees and supplies or replace them. But where would they get their money? They would lose customers the moment they started to act like a government. It is just as likely that they would collapse if they attempted to live by stealing, tax collecting, since they would be compelled by force of other companies to seize and desist their aggression against, their company, against those companies' clients. People raised and educated to love an Agora society could not fall for tax paying, and if they ever do, we will sink all the way down to the road of corruption and oppression to the level of statism that we enjoy today. Second word about territorial defense deals with the concerns of most people when they meet some, some version of anarchy, even the business-like, efficient, free market kind. How does the non-state defend itself against all the states still left? The glib answer is, let me count the ways. A few should suffice to allay nameless fears. First, the context must not be forgotten. Government will not disappear until it is rejected by the overwhelming majority of people under its rule. It is highly unlikely that other people in other countries around the world will be unaffected should North America oust its state through this libertarian infection. A libertarian international formed in 1980, had its first convention in Zurich in August 1982, and continues into the 21st century as the International Society for Individual Liberty, ISIL. Many of these members could be relied upon to act as fifth columnists in their home countries to stop their governments from attacking the obviously peaceful anarchy. Second, although we do not rule out naked aggression, remember that wars are caused by both sides. There is an entire branch of libertarian theory we skipped in making this presentation, actually more than one, called revisionist history, which rips, rips the mask off of government war propaganda to reveal the gleaming skull underneath. The United States, for example, has not been involved in a single war since the first revolution that could, have not, that could not have been avoided, nor one that would have cost American citizens their liberty had it been avoided. 
said Liberty, be, said Liberty to be sure, which they were already losing to their own government. Several volumes have been written about each of these wars from establishment and revisionist perspectives, but let me just list the bold, simple conclusions here, and you can research it for yourself whether I'm right. War of 1812. U.S. war hawks sought a land grab in Canada. Pretext for the war. Impressment of American seamen and ships running the British blockade of Napoleon. True, but trivial in comparison to war and its cost in lives and freedom. Mexican War. U.S. Southern interests sought land grab of Texas and other Mexican territories to form more slave states to balance off new northern free states. Pretext. Mexico attacked Republic, Republic of Texas and thus U.S. soil. Probably not, and Texas was not U.S. soil then. War between the states. North wished to enslave the South. South, justifiably, wished to be free of the North. Pretext. Abolition of slavery in, in South. North kept slavery in Northern Territory. Also, hardcore abolitionists supported both Southern secession and abolition of slavery as same issue of freedom. Spanish-American War U.S. interests grabbed Spanish colonies, Cuba, Philippines, for exploitation and turned the U.S. state into an Old World Empire. Pretext U.S. battleship Maine was attacked in a Cuban harbor, even though innocent Spain apologized anyway and bent over backwards to avoid war. World War I U.S. interests, especially bankers, bet on Great Britain and moved U.S. US in to save their investments when Russians pulled out, leaving Germany one front. Pretext. German U-boats attacked British ship-carrying Americans. Declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare zones by Germany. Trivial relative to war, and U.S. ships should have taken their chances if they insisted on running huge risks for high profits by penetrating the blockades. GB was blockading Germany, and other interests wanted to replay War of 1812 and attack Britain. World War II, Europe 1939. Britain gave Poland a blank check treaty if they would hold out 99% German Danzig from Germany, the last adjustment of the Versailles Treaty ending World War I that penalized Germany. Also, Britain and France refused alliance with Russia against the fascist menace, although Bolshevik Russia was seriously threatened by Nazi aggression, unlike, unlike Danzig-less Poland, not to mention distant Great Britain, and this thus pushed USSR to German side in fear. Poland was overwhelmingly outnumbered and still refused to return German Danzig. Pretext. Germany invaded Poland without provocation. Nonsense. Allied war propaganda. Poland was so surprised that they were already fully mobilized and standing on the border on September 1st, 1939. World War II. Pacific, 1941. The United States New Deal administration sought entry to the European theater and required an attack since 80% of Americans opposed bailing out Britain again. Japanese were strangled by British blockade, aided by neutral U.S. ships. Japanese fund funds in U.S. were seized by U.S. government, and Japanese emissaries for peace were insulted and scorned. Pretext. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor naval installation. Few, if any, innocent U.S. civilians injured. Japan knew it would be dragged into the war and would lose. It struck first to delay the inevitable. Japanese Bushido code was offended, deliberately and provocatively, by U.S. status. Korean War. Artificial division of Korea, World War II, between a northern communist dictatorship and a southern pro-U.S. state dictatorship. U.S. entered to prop up colonies, France and Japan, were abandoning in Southeast Asia for a variety of corporate interests and Soviet containment reasons. Pretext. Communist aggression, which involved China and Russia. China attacked the U.S. after American troops threatened to cross the Yalu River into China. Russia sat back and sold arms, as the U.S. had done before landing troops. Vietnam War U.S. attempted to keep former French Indochina from passing into Eastern Bloc. See Korean War. This was a continuation from 1954. As became obvious immediately after, when China switched over to U.S. side, communist countries are not necessarily threats to U.S. Pretext Defend South Vietnamese who wanted Western-style democracy from communist form of, st form of status. South Vietnamese were split and there were never anything even as free as democracy there under the various generals and the Diem dictatorship. El Salvador. Certain U.S. industries and, blanks, and banks have heavy investments in Latin American countries and fear their expropriation by communist or Marxist governments. Pretext. Salvadorans want democracy, not communism. Salvadorans voted in U.S. monitored election and got a genu genuine fascist government. 
arena party of Robert Roberto D. Albusen, Albusen, and massive murder of Democrats, let alone communists, by arena death squads. The U.S. then overruled the results of an election they had demanded in the first place. Iraq War I. The U.S. sought to preserve its interests in Saudi Arabian oil fields, fearing that if Kuwait fell and former U.S. ally Saddam Hussein enriched himself from oil profits there, then Saudi Arabia might be next. Pretext. Iraq invaded Kuwait, separated from Iraq by British in 1932, to regain its port and to seize oil fields on the theory that they were using a slant drill to drink the milkshake of Iraq's al Ramalia fields. Afghan War. U.S. and U.K. attempt to secure Afghanistan to protect a proposed natural gas pipeline from Turkmenistan to Pakistan and India, passing right through the Kandar province. This in an effort to counteract perceived uh, Russo-Iranian energy trade in the region. Pretext. Taliban gave aid and comfort to 9-11 attack coordinator Osama bin Laden, oppressed women, and served as a training haven for Islamic fundamentalist terrorists. Iraq War II. The U.S. continued to perceive Iraq as a threat to its oil interests in the Middle East, especially after Iraq's scorched earth retreat from the Kuwaiti oil fields in 1991. In addition, personal grudges may have played a part since the sitting president's father had once been targeted for assassination by Hussein. Pretext. Saddam Hussein's repeated scoffling of numerous U.N. resolutions and rumors that Iraq still pursued weapons of mass destruction. By the way, those quick ex- explanations are not meant to convince you that the U.S. was wrong and the other sides were right. The Igor's viewpoint is that the U.S. state was wrong and its war opponents were wrong. Both or either could have avoided any of the above wars. And before we forget, there is an obvious third way the North American non-state defends itself against the state around it if it is, an Igor- if it is Igor's. The protection agencies form larger syndicates than the ones they form in the case we mentioned above of a local protection company going renegade. If all the policyholders of all the insurance and protection companies are threatened by invasion, they will throw all their combined resources and higher technology, judging by free enterprises' past performance, on defense of the common ground. Fourth, the people would rise up in militias or guerrilla units to defend their incredibly free society. There were advanced hints of this strategy when the Ukrainian anarchist army, under Nestor Makhno, had no trouble raising militia to protect the local local fanners from roving armies of reds and whites during the Russian Revolution. Fifth, most wars have had a strong economic component. Often, access to goods or natural resources was barred by protectionist state economic policies. The anarchy would have full free trade with full access. Anyone wanting anything produced in the North American anarchy could easily buy it, without taxes and tariffs and at a cheaper price than anywhere else. Notice how giant communist China went out of its way not to conquer tiny Hong Kong, although the British were ready to toss it to them any time they asked and finally did. Even now, Hong Kong has not seen red Chinese tanks rolling through its streets to to crush its capitalist minions. In fact, much of China has become a mirror of Hong Kong, with party leaders in the People's Liberation Army growing rich on market activities white, black, and gray. Check out the little free ports and cities of Monaco, Andorra, and Liechtenstein, Singapore, and San Marino. Sixth, and we'll have to stop eventually, so let it be here. The states will quarrel among, amongst themselves. Since the anarchy threatens no state immediately, point two, long term it does as is a shining example of better conditions, but other states with standing militaries do threaten at all times what state would want the easy access to resources, point five, and the anarchy cut off by another state using it? That could mean war, but among the states, while well, the anarchy freely sells to all sides without favor of penalty. Critics of market anarchy often try to have their cake and eat it too. For example, they may, ar- they may argue that there are too few states. What happens if the states gang up? And at the same time, too many. How can one anarchy survive among all those states? As in the case of historical examples, such as revolutionary France and revolutionary Russia, where the surrounding states did gang up to crush the new type of state, if the country is big enough, it will survive even foreign interference, even in the middle of civil war, which both experienced, let alone a gorgeous peace. Additional tactics for defense and reasons for non-aggression are left as an exercise for the reader. The Agorist Path Getting from here, statism, to there, agorism, is the second and perhaps defining characteristic of the latter. Unlike libertarianism, agorism offers both goal and path as an internally consistent package deal. The short answer is given in Axiom 4. 
A longer answer is applying counter-economics to all your actions and linking preferentially with others who do so creates an even bigger agora. How that works and what two things you need to watch for is an excellent chapter with which to end this primer. Chapter 8. Applied Agorism. At this concluding point, we would like to tie together all we have learned. Thus, we can clearly see the path to be taken with a view to ending up with a new ability, to figure out how each of us can best walk that path to our own advantage. So let us begin by visualizing that pathway. The Road from Agora. Since we have some picture of an Agora society, an all too good picture of a status society, let us connect them by slowly degenerating one into the other. Since it is usually more difficult to see the real here and now becomes the possible, let's run the film backwards. Let us start with an Agora society and run backwards in time to what we have now, a statist society. The state exists because of a mystique that confers upon it the sanction of the victim. Thus, we each must have lost our sanction of the state for the Agora to have come about. Very well, running the film of this in-between period backward, it should appear that some mental plague is infecting contented Agoras to persuade them, one by one, to give up their freedom and submit to control by some embryonic government, a criminal gang with a good line of buncombe. At first, the state would be able to tax and mobilize only its followers. It would be a voluntary organization, sadomasochistic to be sure, but still tolerated by the unaffected agorists. Every time the state tried to prey on insured agorists, it would be brought to arbitration and restitution enforced. Still, against all reason, the infection grows and the state is too powerful now for restitution to be enforced. Some privileged people are able to live successfully off plunder and be protected by the mindless subjects of the new state who will sacrifice their own property and even their lives so that some may live off others. Remember, this is the opposite of how people think sanely because we are deliberately backwards. It should be a comfort to know that this route is highly unlikely in a forward direction. The state now has its power elite, ruling class, conspiracy, or whatever term you like best. They can distribute some of this unearned wealth to bribe agorists who have little conviction and a weak will to join the infected masses. Now, the state reaches a level that permits it not only to stave off the protection companies, but actually to attack them. At this point, the companies go underground or counter-economic, still enforcing contracts among the remaining agorists and those who are not being very well defended by the inefficient state apparatus, as well as those who are not in favor with the statists' top-level elite. Otherwise, people look out for statist enforcers as much as possible and develop evasive techniques in order to keep their manufacture, trade, and services from detection and capture. They develop counter-economic techniques, and they keep on going. Finally, the state compels its new citizens to give up their gold for worthless paper. And then the state divides into several states and mobilizes the citizens to get to see which ruling class will get the biggest share of the tax plunder. Sound like we've gone a little crazy in imagining anyone permitting this? True enough, but unfortunately, this craziest picture of all describes nothing less than the reality we live in right now. The path from here to Agora now becomes blindingly obvious. As more people reject the state's mystifications, nationalism, pseudo-economics, false threats, and betrayed political promises, the counter-economy grows both vertically and horizontally. Horizontally it involves more and more people who turn more and more of their activities toward the counter-economic. Vertically, it means new structures, businesses and services, grow specifically to serve the counter-economy. Uh, safe communication links, arbitrators, insurance for specifically illegal activities, early forms of protection technology, and even guards and protectors. Eventually, the underground breaks into the overground where most people are agorists, fewer status, and the nearest state enforcement cannot effectively crush them. These agorist condescent uh, condescensions are highly vulnerable when first exposed but will probably evaporate back into the anonymous masses when seriously threatened. Finally, one grows large enough to defend itself against the nearest state. See Chapter 7 regarding the many ways that it can defend itself. Others rally to it, and those gores staying home under state's rule become ever-richer trading ports with the first agora condescensions. Uh, 
The rapid collapse of state taxation ability at this point will push the state to rely even more on inflation to support itself. The counter-economists abandon fiat money ever faster and use gold and trusted Agoras gold warehouse receipts. Hard money checks. The runaway inflation approaches what Ludwig von Mises termed the crack-up boom. Paper money is completely abandoned, like 1923 German Reichsmarks and 1781 U.S. Continentals, and 1787 French assignats. See the aforementioned novel alongside Knight for a thr thrilling presentation of this scenario. At the critical point when the protection companies can protect anyone who asks for a policy and is willing to pay for it, the state loses its monopoly of legitimized coercion. Once the power elite realizes that it has come to this, they will throw all the force they have left at the Agora. The protection companies will defend the Agoras, the taxpayers will flee the state to the free market, the military will desert as the state runs out of acceptable pay and supplies for them, and the state will collapse. The last sentence describes the Agorist revolution, except no substitute behavior involving Agorist attacks on the state. We are strictly defensive. Some people with grudges against the state, incited because of state murdered loved ones, may undertake some spectacular commando raids and such, but that would not be the norm. Having spelled all this out, we still have one big question left unanswered. Why has this not happened already? The false dichotomy. Divide and conquer has been a status motto and tactic since Julius Caesar. The division of libertarianism from counter-economics has many causes, but several can be attributed to status encouragement of illogic, irrationality, and sheer mysticism. Nowhere is this more evident than in the very field of thought confronting us moral philosophy, and economics. It is noteworthy here to remember that the first economist, Adam Smith, was a professor of moral philosophy. Morally, the state and its clerical toadies have separated the moral from the practical. Several strains of religious thought, Kantian altruism, down to Hegel's explicit worship of the state, have told people to try to live morally, but always fail. Then the people were to let the state, blessings of the established church of status ideology, punish them. Economically, the counter-economists have distorted and changed the laws of economics to suit the ruling, goop, uh, ruling group. Mercantilism, economic nationalism, Fabianism, fascism, Keynesianism, monetarism, supply set economics, socialism, social democracy, progressivism, New Deal, Fair Deal, Square Deal, New Frontier, Just Society, Great Society, War Communism, Unspecified Open Change, and the Middle of the Roadism are political frauds and economic nonsense. In most cases, the priests, intellectuals, and rulers knew what they were doing and continued doing it until the snake oil no longer sold. Then they simply slapped a new label on the same noxious brew. Most people are ignorant of economics today and remain frightened by the subject. Most people think morality is either impossible, irrelevant, or something they can do nothing about, but which will, <laughs> but which will catch up with them eventually, either while they are still alive or after their death. As many sages have repeated, the truth will set you free. Even the cases where the truth was dimly seen as through a glass darkly, the liberating effects have been visible. Rebellious religious sects often morphed into authoritarian cults, but some achieved incredible freedom, such as the Rhode Island Baptists, the Pennsylvania Quakers, and the American Deists who advanced the American revolutionary ideology. Adam Smith and his immediate followers in Europe created such an impact in the early 19th century trade policies that a wave of economic prosperity swept the world with just a lowering of trade barriers toward freedom. Then came World War I in the heyday of socialism, justified largely by the failure of free enterprise. It did not fail, it was stifled by internal progressive regulation and external war emergencies. With the collapse of socialism and its various offspring, such as Soviet communism and American liberalism, a vacuum has opened for an ideology to inspire and guide thinking people. Though the states of the world would give lip service to various socialist ideals, they are aware, or their higher circles are aware, that socialist ideals are losing their ability to beguile. Perhaps something called libertarianism, having given up its remaining ties to liberty while promising to provide it through statism, will be the next bottle of snake oil the confidence men of the state will offer to maintain our sanctions. The state in the mind. The state has guns and men to use them. As we have seen, however, it not only can fail to coerce a rebellious majority, it cannot even stop an enterprising minority 
of black marketeers and other counter-economists. The state must be defeated in each person's mind. Once you personally reject its hold over you, you are as free as your intelligence, your will to take risks, and the aid of your allies can keep you. New converts to Christianity describe a similar process, which they call being born again. Even in darkest Russia or China, entrepreneurs thrive and, for a high price, buy their well-being and additional freedom. Of course, any North American, Australian, or, Euro or European listening to this should have a relatively easier time and a higher payoff. What may be needed, in addition to spreading the word and living it, is some form of agorist psychology. Perhaps we can use the examples of therapy for childhood mistreatment or consciousness raising groups for feminists, gays, and other obviously oppressed groups. We can all get together in small affinity groups of trusted friends and allies to dig our contradictions out of our unconscious. We can flush out the state from our heads by ourselves or together or both ways. Every law that you must obey, that you obey must be re-examined with the thought, how does it protect life and property? If, as almost every law in our system does, it actually constricts the market or steals outright, it should not be obeyed save when force is reported nearby and menacing you directly. Once you have successfully arranged your life to live in the free market anarchy, to the extent that you can accept the risks, the higher the risks, the bigger the payoff, including freedom, you can and will, quite naturally, add to your ranks. Risks are lowered by trustworthy marketeers working together. Soon everyone will know Agoras are the most trustworthy of all. Come runaway inflation and depressions, the unemployed and bankrupt in the state's economy will see unlimited jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities, not to mention the preserved wealth for capital, that the counter-economy offers and join it if only to keep from starving, losing their homes, their family support, and their remaining self-respect. Remember, an agorist is one who lives counter-economically, without guilt, for his or her heroic day-to-day -day actions. With the old libertarian morality of never violating another per another person's uh, uh, violating another's person or property. There is no membership card to fool you. An agorist is one who lives agorism. Accept no counterfeits. There are agorists trying to live up to it. There are, of course, liars who will claim to, do, to be anything. As Yoda said so succinctly, do or do not, there is no try. That's agorism. Afterward, beyond basic agorism, a few words may appropriate here for the reader who enjoyed the primer but wishes to go on to the hard stuff. There are two ways to go. Horizontally, one can delve deeply into economics, counter-economics, revisionist history, and some areas not really covered here, such as libertarian philosophy, psychology, and literature. There are plenty of sources for those who wish to check out some of our claims here or specialize in an area of personal excitement. Vertically, one has fewer choices because few publications have emerged so far from this brand new movement. This author has published a new libertarian manifesto available from CoPubCo for those who wish to go beyond more sim mere simple agorism to become activists. Advanced protection agents defending the counter economy by public re relations, education, and other means. Websites such as agorism.info and agorist.com have sprung up created by Agoras, eager to extend theory into practical action. A full-size book, Counter Economics, is awaiting publication at CoPubCo. Though it lay unfinished at the time of SEK3's death, it will emphasize examples and practice, the theory being as much as already covered here.